Good morning. So we begin chapter 10 with an interesting topic and yet another useful topic at the same time, namely the mark of chains. Uh, we will start this with a couple of preliminary stuff and an example just to motivate the concept before we actually define it. So again, that's this is another one of those uh, topics in which you're much better off if you walk uh, through a typical example uh, before we actually get to define the concept of a Markov chain, because it's going to be much easier if we do that rather than just starting with a um, um, definition. Um, so you will see that it has many applications in real life. Um, in particular, just to anticipate a little bit, it's all about uh, random experiments in which the probability of being in one of the outcomes, one of the states of the experiment, if you want, depends on whether you were in a certain outcome uh, when the experiment was run previously. So it always depends on what happened previously, if you imagine that you run or you observe this experiment uh, repeatedly. Uh, another thing is we're going to make use of matrices again. And uh, once you understand how the matrix theory blends in with this concept, you will see that at the conceptual level things could be uh, actually rather easy. Um, especially if you have a computer algebra system that can do the heavy computation. So your job is to just understand the concept and uh, use it correctly. Um, so uh, before we actually get into the uh, example itself relevant to the Markov chains, I warn you that you need to make sure you know how to multiply matrices. So now it's a good time to stop the video if you need to and review the multiplication of matrices in an earlier video. So um, if you really forgot everything about it, uh, go back to that previous lecture and review how you multiply two matrices. I'm going to just put an example quickly just to um, um, have one, you know, and then you decide basically if you actually need to stop the video and uh, go back to, to review how matrices are multiplied. So here's an example. Let's say you have uh, two two by two matrices. Remember, in order to multiply two matrices, you need to, and actually let's multiply one matrix with itself. In order to be able to multiply two matrices, remember the number of um, columns of the first matrix needs to be equal to the number of rows of the second matrix. Uh, and what you do, you basically do the dot product or you multiply the rows of the first matrix with the columns of the second matrix. So again, if what I'm writing right now doesn't make sense to you, uh, you really have to pause the video and just maybe take uh, 20 minutes or so to review how you multiply matrices by watching the previous lecture. So the first entry comes from row one dot product column one. So term by term multiplications of these entries and summation, one times one plus two times three. Um, then it's gonna be color, row one, column two. So that's one times two plus two times four. And then three times one plus four times three, three times two plus four times four. Uh, so we get 10, uh, seven, 10, um, 15 and 22. 16 plus 6. One particular multiplication of matrices that will appear quite often in this chapter is a row matrix. So the matrix made of a single row, for instance, 5, 6, uh, multiplied by a square matrix, uh, let's say 2, 1, 1, 3. So remember, you can still do this multiplication, right? Because the first matrix has one row, two columns. So it's a one by two matrix. And the second uh, matrix has two rows, two columns. So it's a two by two matrix. And the answer is always uh, a matrix with the number of rows of the first matrix multiplied and the number of columns uh, of the second matrix. So bottom line, if you multiply a row matrix by a square matrix, you end up with a row matrix. So the rule stays the same, except you have a single row in the first matrix. We have five, six times two, one, right? So that's gonna be five times two plus six times one. And then row one, column two, five times one plus six times three. 
So 10 plus 6, that's going to be 16. 18 plus 5, um, uh, that's 23. All right, so in particular, pay attention to this example because this type of matrix multiplication will happen quite often in our chapter. Uh, multiplication of a row by a square matrix and you end up with another row matrix because there will be a specific meaning to to this row matrix <clears throat> okay so uh, with that preliminary stuff under the out of the way uh, let's move on to discuss the typical example that leads to the Markov chains so uh, write down and pause for a moment if you need to make sure you write down and then you follow up my explanation so um, suppose um, that's the example of a Markov chain again we're going to define it in a formal way later so suppose that you have a um, number of people who have a certain consumer preference with respect to two soft drinks like Pepsi and Coke. So let's title this experiment, uh, excuse me, this example, uh, consu consumer preference for Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Let's call it Coke. So I don't have to write too many words. And the consumer preference let's say may change from one to another uh, um, with a certain probability so at any given moment of time there is a probability that the consumer will either switch to a different drink or will stay to the previous one that he or she prefers so let's say that 70 percent of pepsi drinkers uh, will continue to drink Pepsi. Now notice that this implies 30% will switch to Coke. All right, so pay attention because if there are only two possible states, the problem may not mention this 30%, but if it's just two possible states, Pepsi and Coke, then it's up to you to figure out that the remaining percentage of probability up to 100% will uh, be the other state, in this case, switching to Coke. And then another piece of information, let's say that 60% of Coke drinkers will continue to drink Coke. And so notice that automatically this implies that 40% will switch to Pepsi. All problems that basically lead to a Markov chain will basically give the information in this type of, uh, this, this format. It will basically, the problem will provide you some probabilities of transition. So if, all we say in these problems are essentially transition probabilities from one state to another. <clears throat> um, so before we get into the matrix theory, because the matrices will be very useful to describe these type of problems, let's do the least efficient way, essentially, namely with a tree of probability. So let's say um that um let's see here an example let's say that initially a person is equally likely to drink pepsi or coke so suppose that a person is equally likely to drink pepsi or coke initially And notice that this experiment is run multiple times. Let's say every day we basically test the hypothesis and every day there could be this change in preference or maybe every month or every year, it doesn't matter. But the problem suggests that at a specific moment of time, 
the patterns of consumption may change, right? So we call these basically observations. So initially, the, when you uh, start with the experiment, you have this person that is equally likely to drink Pepsi or Coke, but then each observation, there is um, a possible transition according to those probabilities from Pepsi to Coke or vice versa. Uh, so how do I, okay, and then the question, for example, could be, um, what is the probability that this person drinks Pepsi or Coke one observation later? Or two observations later, and so on and so forth. So let's see how we do this with the tree of probabilities and you will see immediately that's the least efficient way before we move on to uh, matrices. So if the person is equally likely to drink Pepsi or Coke in the beginning, at the root of the probability tree, let's put it here, the person, uh, so the, the root of the probability tree, the probabilities that you can write are 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Right, so Pepsi or Coke. And then, so that's going to be basically the initial observation. And then an observation later, the transitions of these probabilities happen according to what the problem states in terms of switching of the consumer preference. If the person is to drink Pepsi, so if, if you're here on the Pepsi uh, branch, then there is a probability of 0.7 or 70% probability that the person will stay on the Pepsi, right? So 70% of the Pepsi drinkers will continue to drink Pepsi. And automatically with probability 0 0.3, there's gonna be a switch. Um, and then uh, let's say if the person drinks Coke, then that person will switch to Pepsi with probability 0 0.4 because 60% of them will continue to uh, drink Coke. <clears throat> so 0 0.6 to stay on the Coke. Okay, now we know already how to compute the probability of... Uh, so that's going to be the second observation. So I wanted to say that we know how to compute the probability of the person drinking Pepsi one observation later or Coke by simply looking at how you end up with Pepsi after one observation uh, with this branching out of the probabilities. And remember, um, these are independents from each other. So that means uh, if you go, for example, on this route for the second observation, that means the probability of uh, drinking Pepsi is going to be 0 0.5 times 0 0.7 or maybe you are drinking Coke initially, and then you switch to Pepsi, and that's going to be 0.5 and 0.4. So the probability of Pepsi drinking after one observation will be 0 0.5 times 0 0.7, or another version 0 0.5 times 0 0.4. So I'm going to leave this for now without uh, actual, well, actually, let's actually compute it. That's going to be, um, I think I did it here before, 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.7 plus 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.4. That's going to be 0. 0.55. What will be the probability of drinking Coke? Well, that's going to be either drinking Pepsi first and then Coke. So that's going to be 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.3 or drinking Coke and stay on, staying on the Coke, which is 0 0.5 times 0 0.6. And that's going to be 0.45. Of course, because there are only two possible states, we could have already computed 0.45 as being 1 minus 0 0.55, because there are only two possible states, so they have to add up to 1. Okay, now, um, notice... Uh, that if, let's say, the initial probability is not 50-50, we'll have to do another tree, basically. Okay, so let's say uh, that instead of 
the person being equally likely to drink Pepsi or Coke, suppose for example that a person initially drinks Pepsi. And again, I'm asking the same question, what will be the probability of that person to drink Pepsi or switch to Coke one observation later? Uh, <clears throat> um, well, we, we know already because we have the probability of switching, but let's do it with the tree as well, just to compare it with the previous one. Okay, so if the person drinks Pepsi for sure in the beginning, that means it will drink Pepsi with probability one and zero uh, for for Coca Cola for Coke, uh, and then one observation later again follows from the data in the problem: 0.7 to stay on the Pepsi, 0.3 to switch to Coke, and again here, which will not happen, of course, because like I said, the initial uh, initially the person is just drinking Pepsi and that's it. But just for the sake of the argument, let's put here also the probabilities: 0.4 and 0.6, right? Either switching to Pepsi or staying on the Coke. So again, uh, just like before, the probability after a second observation that the person will drink Pepsi is going to be 1 times 0 0.7 plus 0 times 0 0.4, which will be obviously 0 0.7, or um, for Coke, uh, the probability will be... Um, 1 times uh, 0 0.3 plus 0 times 0 0.6 and of course the answer will be 0.3 okay now the reason I wanted to focus now on these type of products is to see that we can represent these guys these computations much more efficiently with the matrix notation and computation rather than sketching a probability three for all of these situations because in many problems for example the initial probability of whether the person drinks pepsi or um, coke um, may vary right so you may have for example two or three questions like let's say the person is 50 50 pepsi and coke or uh, one fourth pepsi three over four coke so there are multiple questions of this type and it will be very tedious to draw a tree diagram in each case. And the main motivation for the matrix notation is that if I ask, for example, what happens on the third, let's say, um, observation, well, in that case, the tree will branch out quite a lot, right? Because you'll have, um, you know, you have four nodes, P, C, P, C, and then each of them branches out into two other possible nodes and so on and so forth. And if you have more than two states, um, then the tree draw diagram is going to be completely unfeasible to do by hand. So before we move on to the second page, I want you to notice how these summations, these, these uh, products that gave you the probability after the second observation can be represented by matrix multiplication. So pay attention here. Um, when I multiply 0 0.5 with 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 and for Pepsi and Coke, I could have wrote both of these computations in the form of the following matrix multiplication. 0 0.5, 0 0.5 as a row matrix times a two by two matrix, 0 0.7, um, 0 0.3, and then point, uh, 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. All right, so it's very important to actually do this matrix multiplication on your own to convince yourself that that's the case. So you multiply the row 0 0.5, 0 0.5 with these two by two matrix. So remember, you multiply a row by a column. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5 with the column 0 0.7, 0 0.4 gave you 0 0.5 times 0 0.7 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.4. So this stuff here is both these probabilities combined into a single matrix multiplication. When the probability initially was 1, 0 for Pepsi and Coke, the same rule applies. The initial probability uh, distribution was 1, 0. And to obtain what happened a uh, moment later, on the second observation, you multiply that row matrix with the same 2x2 um, two two matrix, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0
0.4.6. So 1 times 0 0.7, 0 times 0 0.4, that gives you 0.7, right? So the answer was 0.7.3. And here, of course, the answer was 0 0.55, 0 0.45. All right, so what is in common? What do we have in common between these examples? Well, what we have in common is this two by two matrix. So notice that regardless of your initial probability distribution, it seems that this matrix, two by two matrix is the same. And this matrix, this two by two matrix is called the transition matrix. Because it gives you the rules of transitioning from one state to another. So you can think of this transition matrix and I'm going to write it down over here again. So 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 and label these rows and columns with P and C from Pepsi and Coke. So each entry gives you the transition probability from one state to another. So think of the row as being the previous state and the column the state at, a, at an observation later. So if you were to drink Pepsi, it was, you will stay on Pepsi with probability 0.7. So you go from Pepsi to Pepsi with probability 0.7. You go from Pepsi to Coke with probability 0.3. So each row gives you the transition probability from one state to all the other possible states. <clears throat> Furthermore, if you are on Coke, then you will switch to Pepsi with probability 0.4 if you were on um, Coke, you will stay on Coke with probability 0.6. So each probability uh, of transition from one state to another is given in this square matrix. <clears throat> that is the reason why uh, the summation of each row is equal to one, because from one state, each row gives you the probabilities of uh, going in all possible states. So they have to add up to one. So we'll stay the, stay this one more time. Um, on the next page, uh, right after we define what we mean by uh, a Markov chain in a general setting, and then we'll continue obviously with other examples. So stay tuned. All right, so let's define what a Markov chain is in a formal way. We'll get back quickly to the previous example to say more on it. And then of course, we'll continue with other examples. So as a definition, a Markov chain is a sequence of experiments, each of which results uh, in a finite number of states that's another name for outcomes basically but we call it states because this random experiment in the context of Markov chains is repeated, right? So you have a sequence of experiments, right? So results in a number of um, states or outcomes. Uh, we'll, call, we'll, call, we'll call them states just to keep up with the definition. Uh, labeled 1, 2, 3, and up to n. We have some... I have some... Uh, um, Notifications that bother me. One, two, three, up to n. <clears throat> and then the probability, that's the feature of the Markov chain. So the probability uh, of being in a particular state depends on that. Uh, the so depends on that previously occupied. Okay, so the state previously occupied. Basically, the state you are in depends on the state you are previously. This is the main I, uh, reason why you can express or you can um, work with matrices when you deal with Markov chains, because we can denote, based on this definition, by Pij, the probability 
of transition from state i to state j. Okay, where i and j are just um, 1, 2, up to n, right? So can be any of these uh, states. So with this notation, then we arrive to what we call the um, transition matrix. denoted by P, which simply has these values, these probabilities uh, by rows. So the transition probabilities from state one on the first row, transition probabilities from state two on the second row, and the transitions from, from state N on the last row. So it's important to understand that each row represents all the possibilities from the previous state. So if you're in state one, then you can go either to state one, two, up to n, each of which with a certain probability. That is the reason why the sum, very important to understand that, why that's the case. So the sum on each row must be one. Otherwise, you don't have a correct transition matrix. It must be one because each row gives you all the possibilities um, for each given state. So again, if I'm state two, I'm gonna go on state one with probability P21, on state two with probability P22, all the way up to state N with probability P2N. So they must add up to one. Uh, in the previous example with the Coke and Pepsi, you could think, like I said before, you could think of that matrix um, being labeled by P and C, right? Well, generally speaking, you call these states one to up to N, right? But you could also label them by um, letters if, if you feel like it, right? Because in that case, each state indicates, you know, either Pepsi or Coke. So uh, that was, uh, what was that? 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and this was 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So notice that each row adds up to one. So another important notation that you have to get used to from now on is the so-called probability distribution. Which is simply a row matrix indicating the probability of being in each state at a given observation. So there is a special notation for this, uh, the notation for the, uh, the uh, probability distribution, just in this book basically, because there are various notations, is V with a symbolic power like this, it's not a real power, don't multiply it k times, but this simply denotes the probability distribution k observation later, k observations later. So, <clears throat> in other words, in our previous example again, Uh, the uh, initial probability distribution will be V0, right? So this will be the initial probability distribution. Um, so for example, uh, when I say that um, the um, person is equally likely to drink Pepsi or um, Coke, that means the initial probability distribution was 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and you call that V naught. One observation later, the probability distribution was 0 0.55, 0 0.45. Um, or in, the, in another case, the initial probability distribution was 1, 0, 
right? So it was Pepsi with probability one, Coke with probability zero. And of course the probability distribution one observation later was uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. And then if we keep on running the experiment, so if I want, for example, the probability distribution two observation later, then you will denote that by two, etc. Um, so on the second page, I'm going to write down in a more formal way how you compute these probability distributions based on the transition matrix. We already did that, but I just want to uh, make sure you guys get used to the notation itself. Uh, and remember, you always use a row matrix for the probability distribution at a given moment of time. I mean, at a given observation. So that means, of course, the rows should, uh, excuse me, the entries should add up to one as well. So stay tuned for the next page. Okay, so remember, um, continuing from the previous page and following that notation, so if P is a transition matrix, of a Markov chain and V naught is the initial probability distribution we already realized that to get to the next uh, probability distribution after one observation we multiply the transition matrix. So if V naught is the initial probability distribution, then the uh, distribution one observation later, which is denoted by V1, is going to be V naught times P, right? So the multiplication between the row matrix V naught by P. And then we can continue this um, process, right? So second distribution, so that means two observation later is going to be V2, which is obtained from the previous distribution times P again. So you always multiply to the right by the transition matrix to get the distribution um, one observation later. Now, these things can be basically written down by keep on multiplying the matrix to the right hand side. So again, just to just to recall what we're talking about here, when I said with the Pepsi and Coke that the um, uh, person is 50 50 between Coke and Pepsi, so equally likely to drink Pepsi or Coke, one observation later, the probability was this distribution times the transition matrix, which in that case was 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, which we computed to be uh, 0 0.55, 0 0.45. So that means one observation later, the probability is only 50, 0.55% to still drink Pepsi and 0.45 to drink Coke. And uh, let's see if I have this example here. Um, well, we'll do another example later. Actually, we're going to do it right now. So um, if the initial probability distribution was just um, Pepsi initially, right? So if the person was drinking Pepsi with probability 1 and Coke with probability 0, we computed that one observation later, the person would uh, drink Pepsi or Coke with probability 0 0.7, 0 0.3, right? So again, you multiply uh, V naught, the previous probability distribution to the matrix itself. And let's say I want to know the probability distribution two observation later. I'm gonna draw this line to separate the two situations. Then I take the previous probability distribution, which is 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and then I can multiply it again with the transition matrix. Um, for that example. So in that case is 0 0.7, 0 0.3 times the transition matrix. Take your time to set up the um, matrix multiplication. And then 
it's uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.3 plus uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. You should end up with uh, 0.61 and then 0.39. I'm going to show you some examples with maple as well, right? But this will be the the transition probability two observations later and you keep on you can keep on going with this process <clears throat> um so let me illustrate it one more time um starting with the initial probability distribution you multiply by p that will give you distribution one more observation later if you multiply by another p that gives you the distribution two observation later. <clears throat> Multiply by another P. That gives you the distribution three observation later and you keep on going. <clears throat> so I want you to pay attention here and notice that either you can keep on multiplying P to the right to keep on getting the distributions one observation later, <clears throat> or you can multiply the matrices together and then the result with the initial probability distribution. So in other words, we also have a meaning to the powers of P, right? So P will be the um, <clears throat> transition matrix for one observation. P squared will be the transition matrix after two observations p to the three will be the transition matrix after obviously three observations and so on and so forth because in some problems for example you may be only interested in um <clears throat> what happens for instance after two observations or after three observations so in that case it might be preferable to just compute the appropriate power of p and then work with that for various initial distributions. Um, just to see that you get the same result, right? So in the previous example here with the initial um, probability distribution one zero uh, that we got after two observation 0 0.61, 0 0.39, we, we got that by multiplying P to the right twice over here and then one more time here. Uh, instead, you could multiply P by itself. So you could compute P squared first, right? So you can compute um, P multiplied by itself. And then each time you multiply that to another initial distribution, then you get what happens to observation later. Um, there was a little glitch with my device. So let me state again the, um, the uh, P squared that I wanted to compute. So once again, this will be the transition uh, matrix to observation later. So there was a little bit of a signal cut because uh, Bluetooth is actually what gets um, the writing from the Plan to the device 0 0.4, 0 0 0.7, 0 0.6.4, 0 0.4, 0.3, and then 0.6.6. .6. All right, so use your calculator, and if you do this correctly, because I did it before, so I should have had I should have this um, on already here. So this should be equal to 0 0.61, 0 0.39. Uh, 0.52, uh, 0.48. So again, the meaning, to give you an example, so the meaning uh, of P, uh, let's say, 2, 1, right? So that means row 2, column 1, which is 0 0.52. That's going to be the probability, pay attention here, that's going to be the probability of transitioning from two to one, two observation later, two observations later. 
Now, in that case, in our problem, what that was um, Coke to Pepsi, right? So the probability of switching from Coke to Pepsi to observation later. Um, and let's check to see if we get the same answer, right? So remember, if we started, we did that before by multiplying P twice, right? So if we started with Pepsi and we multiplied twice by P, we got, if you remember, um, what did we get? We got um, 0 0.61, 0 0.39. So if you multiply uh, 10 to 0 0.61, 0 0.39, 0 0.52, 0.48, well, obviously you're gonna end up with um, uh, one times uh, 0 0.61 plus zero times 0 0.52, and then 1 times 0 0.39 plus 0 times 0 0.48. We did that before, right? So that's going to be 0 0.61, 0 0.39, obviously, right? The, uh, the probability of Pepsi or Coke to observation later. Um, and then you can keep on going, right? So, I mean, for example, let's say I want to know uh, three observations later. So let's say I want three observations later. Well, in that case, Again, you take the probability distribution to observation later. So that means 0 0.61, 0 0.39. And again, you multiply it by the original P, right? The original transition matrix. You should pause the video and do this on your own just to check. You're going to have some homework problems as well. Um, you should end up in this case with the probability distribution 0.583, uh, 0 0.417. Okay, so at this point, we're going to do another example just to set up a Markov chain for a um, case in which we have more than uh, two states. But at the very least, I mean, at, at this moment, make sure you, before you move on, you understand very well the meaning of P, of P to the power N, the meaning of a power of P, um, and the meaning of these notations. All right, so the probability of being in a certain state at a, after several observations. Um, so um, with that being said, I'm going to actually switch to a different page just to have a nice picture before I um, talk about that example. And then that'll be the last example. So stay tuned for the next page. All right, so let's go over this example you will see lots of examples of this type because these are just like um, rolling the dice, right? In the basic probability cases, you know, default examples that are kind of easy to illustrate and follow, which will give you various types of situations, right? In terms of Markov chains. There is a, some silly component of these type of examples, but again, these are the easiest uh, you can think of while still covering most of the situations you want to teach, right? When you talk about Markov chains. Okay, so suppose that uh, we're gonna, you're gonna have to pause the video at some point to, to write this down and then follow with me. So suppose we have a maze with four rooms. Uh, so as in the figure here, as shown in the figure. So notice that the, the, these break points uh, between rooms, those indicate doors. So you have rooms and some of them have doors or more, door, more than one door. For example, two and four has one door, they both have one door, and one and three have two doors each. Um, and then let's say a mouse is placed in the maze, in one of these rooms with a certain probability, and the mouse will move according to the following rules. So based on these rules, your job later on will be to set up the transition matrix and to, uh, of course, first of all, realize it's a Markov chain and then you set up the transition matrix. So the rules are the following. Let's write them as bullet points. So if the mouse uh, is in rooms one or two, it will either stay in that room or move to an adjacent room with equal probability. So each possible move is equally likely. 
that's important to keep in mind okay so each of the possible moves allowed are equally likely and the rules the rule so far is that the, if the mouse is in row um, is in rooms one or two uh, it will either stay in the room or it will move to an adjacent room if the mouse is in room three it will move to an adjacent room suppose there's a cat <laughs> in room three and finally if the mouse is in room uh, four it will stay in that room so suppose there's a piece of cheese in that room or some something attracting that makes him not to move back now why is a markov chain well notice because each state depends on the previous state right so that covers every possible situation whether the mouse one observation later is in room one, two, three, or four. It depends on whether it was in the room one, two, three, or four. Okay, so the probability depends on what happened previously. So the first thing is to write the transition matrix. And you need to practice with this and don't don't move too fast. Once you get the hang of it, it'll be very easy. One of these these are one of the easiest questions. It, it sounds very hard because many of these problems are long, especially if they have more than four states, because you have to describe, you know, the transition probabilities for each of these situations. But once you get the hang of it, uh, it's not that difficult at all. The transition matrix notice is going to be a four by four matrix, right? Because, um, and you can actually, you can start by writing it in form of, um, a table before you actually write down what the matrix is so let me actually let's do it like that let's do a table with the states labeled on the rows and columns and then the matrix will be inside that table right the the probability um, the transition matrix so you go by each row so if you are in room one the rule is that the mouse either stays in the room or moves to an adjacent room so if these possibilities are equally likely first of all you have to ask how many possibilities for each state and if you look at room one because i have two doors so look at room one in the figure uh, there are in total three possibilities because the mouse is allowed to stay so it will either stay or move and moving is possible in two rooms two or three because of the doors so you have three possibilities and because they have to add up to one because these are all the possibilities each of them is with probability one third but make sure you place it in the correct column so one to one means the mouse will stay in the room so that's probability one third one to two it's possible because there's a door over there so that's probability one third one to three it's possible because there is a door over there one third but one to four is zero right there's no door between one and four pay close attention from two the situation is the same except that there are only two possibilities it will either stay or move but because there is only one door that means the mouse either stays with probability one half or moves with probability one half so it goes from two to one with one half it will stay two to two and then from two to three and two to four the probabilities are zero moving on to room three here it will move there is no option to stay in room three so how many possibilities well there are two doors to one and four each of them will be equally likely so again it's 50 50 but notice i have to make sure i place them in the correct column so three to one there's a door over there one half three to two that's not possible there's no door three to three the rule states that that's not possible because the mouse must move three to four 
uh, there's a door over there, so it's one half. Again, the reason it's one half is because there are only two possible moves. They have to add up to one. What about four? Well, if it's in room four, it will stay in that room. Um, so for if it's already in state four, it will not go to one, it will not go to three, it will not go to three, it will stay with probability one in room four. So once, it, once the mouse gets to room four, it will stay there forever, according to these rules. So when everything is said and done, the transition probability matrix will be one third, one third, one third, zero, one half, one half, zero, zero, um, one half, zero, zero, one half, zero, 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 one. And now you can ask the same questions like before in terms of initial probability distribution, um, one observation later, two observation later. So as an example, let's say we say that uh, the mouse initially is equally likely to be in room uh, one or three. Uh, what is the probability distribution one observation later? So if it's equally likely in room one or three and that's all, then the initial probability distribution, pay attention here, is going to be one half for room one zero for room two, one half for room three, and zero for room four. Again, it's one half because there's only two possibilities, one or three. So for example, if I said the mouse is um, equally likely in room one, two, three, then you'll have one third, one third, one third, and zero. As such is one half and one half for rooms one and three and zero for two and four. Uh, and then the problem is asking what's V1, right? What's the distribution one observation later? All you got to do, according to what we learned already, take the previous probability distribution, multiply it with the transition matrix. And please take your time to do this slowly. And if you did everything correctly, you should end up with 5 over 12, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 4. Um, you know, just to check, for example, the second entry, that should come from row 1, right? The V0 times the second column. So that will be 1 half one times 1 third plus 0 times 1 half plus 1 times times 0 plus 0 times 0, which of course is 1 over 6. So this is how you get... Uh, that entry and you do the rest to, to check. So that's it for uh, this initial lecture on the Markov chains um, and I'll see you next time.